What's up YouTube? In today's episode from RSAC 2024, I'm joined by Jim Hyman, the CEO of Order, who are on a mission to make the connected world a safer place. With digital transformation leading to the explosive increase of connected assets and expanded boundaries for enterprises, each unknown, unmanaged and unsecured asset increases an organization's attack surface. Order addresses the entire asset management journey using a whole enterprise philosophy and the order data lake populated with a rich and growing library of millions of detailed asset profiles powered by artificial intelligence, machine learning classification and data analytics. Order identifies and secures every asset in the network, IT, IoT, IOMT and OT devices, users, SaaS and cloud workloads. They map the entire enterprise attack surface, prioritize vulnerabilities and risks and accelerate segmentation and protect each device against cyber attacks with automated policies. And today with Jim, we cover what problem order solve, what does the future of OT look like, how order are solving that problem, what we can all do better, and obviously what next for AI. So I hope you enjoy the content. Find out more about order in the description. And remember, these episodes are not sponsored. They are a way for the InfoSec Live community to bring you some of the vendor insights that we heard at the RSA conference 2024. So I hope you enjoy, watch it till the end, Keep an eye out for the next episode. Thanks very much. Great. My name is Jim Hyman. I'm the CEO at Order. Order is a device awareness, security, and visibility company trying to solve the problem. The most basic problem really of just what's on my network. And it's a, it seems like an easy thing to do, but I'll talk on it a little bit later about it. it's not so easy to do, but it's it's kind of the first step. And my background is roughly 25 or 30 years in cyber. I worked for uh, email security companies, web security company, proxies, on-prem. I've kind of seen it all in cyber um, and joined Order about 18 months ago. So the uh, initial problem that we've solved, which has shifted a little bit, was these networks, enterprise networks, healthcare networks, have IoT devices, OT devices that are not managed today. They don't have agents on them. Uh, traditional security teams don't see them. Networking teams don't necessarily know where they are. Uh, people are adding new devices to the network all the time, either on a guest network or a cloud instance, or even within the core network. And visibility for those IoT and OT devices has just been really, really poor. And and has have we seen a decrease in that? Because I was having a conversation with someone yesterday who said there were more undiscovered IoT type devices on the network now than there were three years ago. Well, I think that's probably true, but I think that that's a numbers game a little bit, Simon, where there are probably more undiscovered IoT and OT devices, but that's primarily due to the fact that the, the proliferation of those devices has just doubled every year. And so the, the sheer volume of IoT devices has changed. And the, you know, the best example of that is with a recent customer, we were talking through their attack vectors and their different OT and IT, IoT devices. And they, we got into a conversation about their elevator shafts. 15 years ago, you didn't need to worry about an elevator shaft being an, an OT device. Um, and so while I think that statement is probably true, it's not a bad thing. I don't think it means that the problem is getting worse. It just means that the number of devices is growing. The, the trend, though, that's happening, which I think is fantastic for the security industry, is IoT and OT used to be a little bit of a side case in organizations. I mean, in a lot of cases, the core IT security team didn't have responsibility for those devices. There were separate teams. Uh, in the healthcare industry, there are completely separate organizations that, that manage IOMT devices. And what we're seeing now more and more is that those are changing. And so IoT, OT are coming under kind of traditional CISO budgets, traditional CISO organizations. They are managed by the IT organization. And I think it's great. They should be um, because those devices now are all online. They all have access to your networks. They're all communicating east-west on your, your, your traffic. And so they should, they should absolutely be part of the core security posture of any of these large enterprises. Yeah, so I think that's actually an interesting question. So there are two things happening on the OT space, though. One is what you talked about, which is the, the talent that understands how some of these devices were built in the first place is retiring. Uh, but the second thing is some of those devices, and if you look at some of the core OT, these are devices that have a useful life of 20, 30, 40 years. And they have, you know, they're running Windows 10, and, you know, they're outdated, or they're running something you don't even know. And so you can't just replace them. And so, you know, we do a lot of work in the healthcare industry, and the idea of going in and replacing a $10 million MRI machine or 30 of them simply because the software isn't patched and it's outdated and it's not supported, even though the machine works perfectly, 
just isn't an option. And so from a security perspective, I think you, need, you just need to look at different ways of securing. I think we get this mindset that if you want to secure a device, you patch it, you update it, you're always on the latest version. And after three years, when its useful life is done, you just throw it away and you buy a new one. Um, in OT, that's not true. And so we're doing a lot of work now on how do you limit the blast radius of something that may happen to one of those OT devices? And so can you quarantine it? Can you limit its communication? Can you only allow communication to a certain server where it's sending information? Because you can't just get rid of it. And so I, while I think some people are, are leaving the industry that know how to fix it all, it doesn't mean you can just get rid of it. And so you need to figure out how to secure it. So to me, it seems so simple to think about it this way, but the, the core step to solve the problem is just to figure out what's on your network. And so I meet with security teams all of the time that talk about you know, things they want to be doing to limit their vulnerabilities, things they want to be doing to do segmentation on their network. And all of that's great. And I agree with it completely. Those are, those are important steps. The, you know, if you read all of the pundits today, the, the answer first is, what's on my network? And so identifying OT devices that are, that are vulnerable, identifying IoT devices, getting a CMDB that has everything in it with an accurate picture of what's on my network is the first step, for you sure. You can't protect it if you don't know where it is. You can't protect it if you don't know where it is. Now, the issue becomes what the natural gut reaction is that we see from everybody is once I know where everything is, and you see these vulnerabilities, you see all the red lights flashing, your immediate instinct is to go fix all the vulnerabilities. And I think it's a mistake. The, the first step should be to figure out how do you segment What's really critical? How do you take your PCI devices? How do you take your edge devices? How do you take your air-gapped systems? And how do you segment? So at least you know uh, the, the levels of, of severity of the different systems. Once you have those separated, then you go down the road of identifying and kind of ranking your vulnerabilities. You know, going back to my example of OT, you might have a device that has 150 known vulnerabilities on it, but you can't fix them, so don't worry about it. Like just quarantine the device, segment the device, do whatever you need to do and figure out how to focus on the vulnerabilities that matter most. And so from our perspective, the piece of this puzzle that we solve is we're trying to give you that single source of truth for just what's on your network. And then you can marry our data with all the threat intel feeds and all the XDR players and all these guys that have the threat information. And the combination of those two tells you exactly what you need to go do and when you need to go do it. Yeah, so from, from our perspective, I think there are a few things that the security industry should be doing and thinking about um, to kind of help with this problem. We talked a little bit about kind of the steps you should take as you go through. You hear a lot uh, of buzz around kind of this idea of zero trust. And I think the idea of zero trust is good. Um, and I think in the end of the day, it's a great journey, but we view it as a journey. And so I don't view zero trust as a destination, I view it as a journey. And there are all sorts of different layers um, and I think to some people, zero trust is daunting, and therefore they decide not to kind of start that journey. The segmentation piece we talked about, kind of what I'll call macro segmentation, is a first step on, on zero trust, where, where we see the more mature kind of digital transformation security companies going, eventually you get to a world where you're doing a micro segmentation. And it, it is possible to get there for these large organizations where we now see policies that are automated in place with these, these companies literally down to a singular device. And so if there's an attack against ring cameras, it doesn't mean you need to go wipe out all your ring cameras. You know, knowing what a specific camera is running, what version it's on, where it's located, what it has access to, who's the admin, it enables you now to say there are just five ring cameras that are dangerous for us and those need to be dealt with. So it's an interesting question. And so I think part of it is you, you get hung up on, you use the term AI or LLMs or whatever, you know, the, the, the phrase du jour. And I think there's a little bit of an eye roll of like, what are you really doing? What are you really using it for? And the reality is it's gonna change the security landscape. So at order, we're using it in really two, two ways, which is super powerful. So I talked about this idea of you know, us building an asset intelligence platform where we are the single source of truth for what's on your network. But imagine this world with AI where now we can marry real time what we know about devices and what we know about uh, software that's running on devices. And you can marry that with zero day threat information through AI to do pattern matching to say, great, this hit, whatever it is, move it, whatever you want, you pick your vulnerability again of choice, 
and immediately it pumps out and says, these 17 servers and these three people and these you know, five devices are susceptible to that thing in almost real time is pretty incredible. And so the old world where a vulnerability hits and everybody scrambles. You know, I started, when I first started, you know, the first thing you do is you just go unplug everything in the network. But for the last 10 years, people scramble. And the first question CISOs ask is like, where am I vulnerable? And so AI really can help in that analysis, for that, which I think is super interesting. The second part where AI comes in is really around these large language models. I think the days of going in and having to do a Boolean search for, you know, move it, server, Linux, like, those are over. And so, you know, in our engine now, you go in and you type anything you want. You know, show me every new device that showed up on my guest network in Rochester in the last week. You know, great, there it is. Um, and so the LLM component of it from a pure uh, knowledge and search capability, I think is super, super interesting and isn't going away. Now, the flip side, obviously, is the attacks that we're seeing are coming through at a volume you can't even imagine. And they're, um, and they're more sophisticated. And sophisticated. Yeah. And we see that from the most basic uh, attacks where you know it starts with the seemingly never solved problem of phishing. Um, and you get spear phishing attacks and you get deep fake attacks. And that is an issue. Um, and we're, we're already running into it where I think that is going to pose a whole new sort of threats. And, you know, I, I went to a, a federal uh, uh, panel a couple of days ago and talking about kind of how that's being used as an attack vector against critical infrastructure. And again, so we do a lot of work with hospital systems. And, you know, unfortunately, they are a target. Um, a huge majority of the, the ransomware is hitting hospital systems and healthcare systems. And it's, you know, we, we saw it most recently with obviously the change healthcare attack. Um, so that's a scary thing, I think, from an AI perspective. And maybe one of the reasons why you don't see it in every booth, though, is, you know, you're looking at the change healthcare attack. That wasn't fancy AI. I mean, they attacked something that didn't have MFA loaded on the edge of a network. And so, like, that could have happened 10 years ago. Um, and that's more of a problem of, you know, M&A and goes back to my original comment of you're going to do M&A, you're going to do mergers, you're going to do whatever you're going to do. Your first order of business should just be to understand, like, what do you have? Um, but, it, but it hasn't been, has it? But it, why not? Like, it's so easy to do a deal like that, to do an M&A, go into the system and say, show me every edge device that doesn't run MFA. Show me every laptop that doesn't have my endpoint agent loaded that should. Show me all my MDM tools that aren't on my cell phone. Show me devices that are not guest devices that are loaded on my guest network. Like those are, those are simple old school attack vectors um, that I think we just need to be thinking about. Um, it does lead me to the last part of my other question of this industry, which is one of the things that I love about this industry in general is when I ask people, you know, why did you join order? Like, why are you coming to do this? I think there's so many industries you can be in where your goal is to be famous, to be rich, to be whatever. Um, and that's fine. Everyone to their own. But so many people that I talk to who join order just say it's so important what you're doing, you know, protecting infrastructure, protecting hospitals, protecting healthcare in general and protecting other enterprises. Um, it's just great. Like it's a good thing to be doing, you know, trying to figure out how to stop ransomware, how to talk these, you know, how to stop these zero day threats. Um, and I think that's awesome. I mean, I think people, I, I hope to think that people join companies like ours because they think it's a good thing we're doing and not just because they want to be rich and famous. Um, and, and that's kind of this industry in general, as you're talking to people, which I, I think is really important for me.